Good morning. Happy Palm Sunday. Uh, if you would have told me six months ago that my son would be dancing around this church, uh, it's, God is moving and can bring people back to life. Amen? Uh, about a week, a month ago, Doug asked me to preach on Palm Sunday. Um, Usually I need three months prior warning, but I've been studying the book of Jude, and I just realized there's way too much going on in that book to cover in one Sunday. And at the same time, I had this year, God kind of led me to celebrate Lent and Ash, Ash Wednesday, uh, which I usually don't pay much attention to. You know, I grew up Catholic, as some of you did, and uh, we'd honor Lent and Good Friday and such, but honestly, I never knew really why, what was behind the rituals and all that. You know, for us, church was a cultural thing. We went because our, our families went, and uh, that's what we did. And then when I became a believer in college, um, I started going to evangelical, non-denominational churches, and we tend to discount formal styles of worship or what's called liturgy. And I think like human beings doing everything, we, we just go too far. We tend to throw the baby out with the bathwater, or as my family would say, throw the cannolis out with the gun. <laughs> so I felt led to teach about observing Holy Week uh, in a more, more structured way. And I feel there's just so much church history that is good and healthy that we can learn from and grow from. In addition, I wanted to provide a practical way for me, and then you guys as well, to celebrate Holy Week every day of this week. Um, so the goal is that we would get some structure maybe to set apart a special time every day this week to celebrate what Jesus has done for us and to contemplate, again, all that he taught and all that he did and all that he suffered for us. Holy Week runs from today, which is Palm Sunday, hence the palm trees, um, and it runs through next Sunday, which is Easter Sunday. It has a very long tradition in the church as a time of celebration as well as contemplation. So today I'm going to give you some brief history, and then what we're going to do is we're going to do a day-by-day -day scripture reading and then uh, a brief study for each day of the week. So we're going to move pretty quickly because it's eight days. Each day in Holy Week has its own name, but a few uh, don't. So I added them. I kind of took Holy Week from, well, maybe great to... <laughs> uh, anyway, um, so let me know at the end of the sermon which names I made up. And no cheating, you can't check on the internet, and maybe there'll be a prize. Uh, and then finally at the end, I wanted to provide you with a devotional and a Holy Week guide as kind of a little bit of something to take away that you can use every day um, as you observe this crowning week in Jesus' ministry. So before we actually get into Holy Week, we're going to start talking about preparation for Holy Week. And there historically have been many preparatory events, typically include what's called Carnival or Carnival, Ash Wednesday, and Lent. Now, when you and I think about Carnival, we think about a fair. And in fact, you saw up earlier and Rhonda mentioned, we're going to have a Carnival after Easter with games and stuff for kids. Um, but in history, this was a Christian celebration. It's also called Mardi Gras, which you have heard of. Um, and it's historically been a time of celebration by Christians before Ash Wednesday and Lent. Uh, so the word is actually derived from this word up there, which is uh, a Latin word, carnum lavare, which means to take away meat. And if you grew up as a Catholic or a Lutheran or maybe an Anglican, you probably... Uh, fasted from meat on Fridays during Lent. That was a tradition that a lot of the, uh, the churches would do. Ash Wednesday is the first day of Lent, uh, and it occurs 40 days before this coming Friday, Good Friday. And the ashes serve as a reminder of our mortality and the transitory nature of earth earthly pleasures. And it's also accom accommodate or accom what's the word I want, hold on, accompanied 
when the, when the priest is putting the ashes on you, it's a variation of words that remember that you're dust and dust you shall return. And what's interesting about the ashes, I had no idea, is that they're typically obtained by burning the palm leaves from the previous year's Palm Sunday. And that's where that comes from. Uh, Lent is this period of preparation for Holy Week. And it's a period of fasting, uh, and it was been observed really all the way back to apostolic times. Uh, it was formalized uh, years later, but it, it was initially a time of baptism for new believers and a time of serious penance for sin. But more recently, it's been become this time of prayer and devotion and fasting. And it's in honor of the 40 days that Jesus fasted in the wilderness before his ministry. So that's kind of the pre- preparation for Holy Day. Now let's look at the structure of Holy Week itself. Um, and again, as I said, it starts with celebration, Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry of Jesus, and we'll get into that. And then we go into this uh, six-day period of contemplation and considering all the things Jesus did and why he did him and why he did it and the prophecies he fulfilled, and then ending with his suffering and crucifixion. Uh, which is called the passion, if you're not familiar with that term. And then finally, it all leads up to that final celebration of Easter Sunday, where we celebrate the resurrection of Christ and his victory over death, which he promised us to an everlasting life. Now, what's interesting is this is by far the most written about week in the Bible. There are probably over, I I calculated over 30% of the gospel narratives are dedicated to this one-week period of Jesus' three-year ministry. So obviously, it had a lot of importance and relevance. And in fact, a lot of the parables that Jesus taught are actually during this time. So let's go ahead, and um, since we didn't have a reader, as I said, we're going to read a scripture for every day. You don't have to stand. The scriptures are going to be on the screen. If you want to follow along, if you want to read out loud, that's fine. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the scripture for each day, and then we'll do a quick quick teaching. So let's start with uh, today, Sunday, Palm Sunday. And we're reading in John chapter 12, verses 13 through 16. And starting in verse 13, they took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and these things had been done to him. So Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry, uh, caravans full of people from all over Israel, coming to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover, one of the biggest feasts in Israel's year. And not just Jews, there was other people as well. Uh, Converted Gentiles, which are called proselytes. Mark mentioned some Greeks that requested to speak to Jesus, so they'd come up from Passover. So all kinds of people groups here. The Jews, of course, Greeks, probably some Italians, maybe even some gypsies, who knows. Now, what I want to do is focus on just a few things in this scripture. First is the palm branch. What, what's the purpose of that? What's the significance? Well, in those days, they didn't have ticker tape parades. So when a king or a conqueror came to town, they would wave palm branches and throw it down at their feet. Thus, this symbolizes that the crowd is recognizing Jesus, Jesus as the prophesied Messiah coming to free them. And this word Hosanna, Hosanna actually means save us. And it is a from a prophetic psalm, Psalm 118, excuse me, a messianic psalm. And and Psalm 118, verses 25 and 27, they read this way, Lord, save us, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us. With bows and hands, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. So you have this psalm written hundreds of years earlier that Jesus is fulfilling right here and now. But they believed he was coming to deliver a political victory to them. Israel was under Roman occupation, and they 
Again, we probably all would have, right? We figured, oh, he's coming, and he's the Messiah. He's going to save us. He's the king. He's going to throw off this political occupation. But as is often the case, Jesus had something much bigger in mind, which was a victory over death itself. Have you ever had a situation like this where you're praying for one thing and Jesus is doing something much bigger? I met with my friend Andrew Kormelitzen yesterday, and some of you know, some of you know, Andrew has just gone through five lifetimes of trauma and sickness and illness. And uh, in fact, uh, the elders prayed with him just a few weeks ago for healing from various serious, serious ailments. And yesterday, when Andrew was speaking with me, he said, you know, God is changing me out of that. He hasn't healed all the physical stuff, but in Andrew's words, he's done much more. Um, You know, a year ago, Andrew would have been immobilized by this. I know because I was there with him. Uh, He would have been in his room, in the dark, depressed. Yet, he's totally changed. He is out and about. Amen, right? He's out and about. He is meeting with people. He's enjoying life. Um, He's got a confidence and optimism that I, I I just haven't seen. And so, it's so cool, Andrew. Thank you for letting me share that, but I think a lot of you have seen that as well. It's just amazing what God is doing. Amen. So we're still praying for physical healing, but, uh, and he did heal him with shingles, amen, but the spiritual healing has been that much bigger victory. And that's what Jesus does a lot in our lives. And that's what he's doing in the life of the nation of Israel. Lastly, this phrase, riding on a colt. You know, typically when a king or a, a war general would come into town, he'd be riding in a chariot or a, a war horse girded for battle. But Jesus came on a colt a young male donkey, as a sign of humility and meekness. And this has a lot of significance. Number one, it was showing that his kingdom would not be taken by force. Secondly, it was a fulfillment of the prophecy of Zechariah 9.9, which says, I mean, it's almost verbatim, rejoice greatly, daughter Zion, shout, daughter Jerusalem, see your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. So here you have in this one day, this one thing, two different, very distinct, detailed prophecies being fulfilled by our King Jesus. And then finally, this also ties him to King David. In fact, in Matthew's Gospels, the crowds recorded shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. And the son of David means an heir to the kingdom of Israel. And it's really interesting. If you go back to 1 Kings, there's a story of when Solomon is crowned or coronated as king from his father David. And this is what it says. It says, So Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, Benaiah, son of Jehoda, the Carathites and the Pelathites went down and had Solomon mount King David's mule and they escorted him to Gihon. So again, Another, I would say prophecy, but prelude. As as we see all these things in the Old Testament, they all lead to Jesus. Um, So it's just amazing, everything that was fulfilled. Monday, the next day. We're going to read from Mark chapter 11, verses 15 through 17. They came to Jerusalem, and Jesus entered the temple and began to throw out all those who were sold and who bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. He would not allow anyone to carry a container through the temple. He taught them, saying to them, Isn't it written, My house will be a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. So it's interesting. The first thing Jesus does as he comes into town as the king is he cleans house. Into the temple, it says. Now, what's interesting about, you can go to the next slide, um, is that Jesus is not upset that they are trading and selling because they had to do this because they were coming to the temple from a long way away and they needed sacrificial animals. What he's upset about is where they're doing it. They are actually doing it in the temple itself, which is his father's house. 
Secondly, it says for all nations. From the beginning, the temple was to be for all nations, not just the Jews. But the Jews wanted nothing to do with the Gentiles. They had kind of warped their understanding of of God's word. Um, And most likely, the trade was actually going on in a specific court of that was designated just for the Gentiles. So the Jews were actively working against what God had called them to be, which was a light to the nations. And then finally, he called it a den of robbers. Not only were they trading, but they were taking advantage of these pilgrims. Imagine you come from miles away and you need to buy food. They needed to buy animals for sacrifice. They couldn't bring them because the, they're walking. And so the traders were giving them this inflated cost and, in, and hindering the worship of God. This is why Jesus was so angry. Tuesday, we're going to read Matthew 21, 18 through 20. Early in the morning, as Jesus was on his way back to the city, he was hungry. Seeing a fig tree by the road, he went up to it, but found nothing on it except leaves. Then he said to it, may you never bear fruit again. Immediately, the tree withered. When the disciples saw this, they were amazed. How how did the fig tree wither so quickly, they asked. This day is the day where probably Jesus did the most teaching during Holy Week. You can go ahead and change the slide. Um, He was constantly teaching in the temple, in parables, debating with scribes and Pharisees, and speaking prophetically about end times. And this cursing of the fig tree seems really odd at first glance. In fact, I was talking to my wife, Kimberly, and she's saying, yeah, her her dad went to a unification church, and their exegesis of this, when it wasn't really exegesis, their explanation for this was that, well, Jesus was having a bad day. So, So if you have a bad day, don't be too hard on yourself. Of course, it has nothing to do with that, which reminds us of how important it is to study and to have good teaching on the Word of God. Because you can go crazy directions if you are not grounded and understand the Word of God. What, why he actually did this is because the fig tree is symbolic of the nation of Israel. It had the appearance of health, yet when you got up close, there was no fruit. It was like the scribes and the Pharisees who Later that week, Jesus would call whitewashed tombs. They looked great on the outside, but inside they were dead. The story also mentions how the the disciples were so astonished at how quickly it withered, which again was a foreshadowing of how quickly Jerusalem would fall. (laughs) Wednesday. Don't you like that? I kind of wanted to be, what's that crime show where they go, dun-dun? You know, I I, I think next time, Isaac, I want that sound effect for me. But um, Wednesday. (laughs) So uh, we're going to read Matthew 26, 14 through 16. Then one of the 12, who was called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests, and he said, what are you willing to give me that I should deliver him to you? And they weighed out for him 30 pieces of silver. From that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. You can change the slide. I love this one name, Spy Wednesday. This, the story of Judas' betrayal, again, another fulfillment of prophecy. Zechariah 11, 12 through 23 reads, I told them, if you think it best, give me my pay. But if not, keep it. So they paid me 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter. The handsome price, and this is God speaking, of which they valued me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them to the potter at the house of the Lord. So again, another incredible detailed prophecy fulfilled um, when Judas makes this deal with the Jewish leaders to betray betray Jesus. You know, and Matthew writes later, or or in his account, uh, after Jesus is crucified, that Judas felt remorse and threw the money back in the temple. And what did the leadership do with it? They bought a potter's field, exactly as prophesied by Zechariah. Second, it shows the hypocrisy of the Jewish leadership. And we talked about this when we were going through um, the Gospel of John, where 
you know, here they were scheming to crucify Jesus, but they wouldn't go into um, uh, the general's house. What's, his, what's the guy's book? Pilate, thank you. Pilate's house, because they didn't want to get defiled for, for um, the Sabbath. Here, you got Judas. I mean, this isn't just some random guy off the street, right? This, um, and, and they com- conspire, excuse me, they conspire to kill him. So these were guys that were focused on small matters. They weigh these heavy burdens and requirements on the people, yet totally miss what was important. In fact, Jesus had this to say about the scribes and Pharisees. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you've neglected the more important matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. So for them, conspiring to kill an innocent man, the Son of God no less, wasn't a big deal, but you better not forget to tithe on your dill weed. You got that, Armstrong? You got a lot of vegetables. I expect to see it. Um, And then finally, a betrayal of a close friend. Judas has been with Jesus for his whole ministry. I mean, this guy was part of the 12. They spent three years together, just about all the time. I think sometimes we forget this. Judas was with the 12 when they went out, and Jesus gave them authority to heal and to cast out demons and proclaim the kingdom of God to to the rest of the Jewish nation. Imagine the pain of being betrayed by someone you had spent so much time with and invested and grown close This was a huge blow for Jesus emotionally. We know the physical stuff that's coming, but let's not skip over this. Um, And it was this friend and what he did was what precipitated that suffering and ultimately crucifixion. Thursday. We're going to read John 13, 34 through 35. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you you also are to love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. This day is called Monday Thursday. Some of you may have heard the word. I had no idea what it meant. Um, but it comes from this Latin word, mandate, mandatum, which basically means mandate or command. So throughout church history, and this is the day of the Last Supper, this day of the Last Supper, which you would think it's Last Supper Thursday. No, it's, it's Monday Thursday. So it shows you the significance that the church has historically placed on this new command that Jesus gave. And by the way, this is the only new command that Jesus gave during his ministry. He elaborated on some, but this is the one new command he gave. And in this new command, Jesus raises the definition of love to a new and higher standard. He even loved his enemies. And he calls us to show love to those who don't appear to deserve it. Because lest we forget, neither did we. The Bible said Jesus loved us when we were yet sinners. But this is what people will notice about us. It is the most important evangelism tool we have to see a community of people that deeply, deeply care about each other, especially now in this fractured world that we live in, to see people that care, to see people that love, that go the extra mile for one another. It's huge. Friday, we're going to read Romans 6, 6 through 7. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. We call this Good Friday. Um, In some ways, a very ironic name given the horrific suffering that Jesus went through. I grabbed this picture. I think it's from the Passion of the Christ movie, but... Most of the pictures aren't this kind of brutal, but I chose this one to remind myself just how much Jesus suffered for my sins, for our sins. And in this, Jesus' suffering death, he defined that new commandment he had just given the disciples hours before. 
He sacrificially loved them by meeting their deepest need and our deepest need, that of new spiritual life and the forgiveness of our sins. As he had said during the Last Supper, greater love has no one than this, that a person will lay down his life for his friends. And then he did it. And along with it, he gives us a new identity. We're no longer under the law of sin and death. Amen? We are now children of God's saints. We are saints. Do you believe that? I have a hard time believing that sometimes, but it is true. And, you know, sometimes, you know, in our culture, it's used weirdly, but we are all saints. I am a saint. I want you all to repeat it out loud with me. I am a saint. Think about that. When the, when the, when the enemy comes, when the, when the negative thoughts come, you remember who you are in Jesus Christ. Saturday. We're going to read John 19.30. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he, bestow, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Black Saturday. It is finished. Jesus' work is done. It's called Black Saturday because Scripture doesn't record what his spirit did when he left his body. It's basically quiet of what Jesus did during this time. We know he went to paradise because he said he did to the thief on the cross. Now, there's many perspectives of other things he may have done, but the reality is his work was finished. And we can add nothing to the work of Christ. And this is where so many people in the faith go wrong, thinking that the sacrifice of Christ was not enough for them, thinking that, well, yeah, but I'm really bad. Um, That is not what Scripture teaches. Romans 10.10 states, we have all been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And I know most of you know that, but we have to be reminded of it. We have to remind ourselves There is nothing else that needs to be done. We are good with God. We are good with Jesus. Let's remember to rest in that assurance. We cannot lose the salvation that Jesus, God, bought with his blood. John 10, 28 through 29 says, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. You are gripped by the Father and by the Son, and you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. You're not going anywhere. (laughs) Easter Sunday. And before we read this verse, I just wanted to comment on the word Easter and the origins, because I was taught growing up that came, came from a pagan festival or goddess, And it's actually not true. I mean, if you think about it, it was actually a very improbable thing because from the get-go in the book of Acts, the apostles' teaching, it was always against paganism and these multiple gods. So it's now, it's pretty widespread consensus that Easter, the word, actually derives from a Latin phrase, albus, which was understood as the plural of alba, which means dawn. That, over time evolved into an old high German world called Eastarum, Eastarum, and then Easter. I thought that was cool. Um, Because I always thought, oh, you you shouldn't call it Easter, because no, it's, 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 it's a good origin, it's a good name. So let's read our verse. It is for freedom that Christ set us free. Right, Derek? Galatians 1, 1. Freedom. This is my favorite verse in the Bible, by the way. Freedom from guilt, from shame, from punishment, even death. Freedom to love unconstrained. You know, Jesus did not die to burden us with heavy loads. Instead, we can rejoice and celebrate the freedom that God has given us. So let us relax. You know, Dave Ekman always says, Jesus is an easygoing God. So let us take that to heart and relax in our salvation. 
And then I encourage us all to do something fun on Easter, to celebrate and glorify him in that. And if you don't have plans, you got a carnival right here. Amen? And Gerard will dance. <laughs> That's all right. In spirit. Um, so I want to leave you with a couple tools. I put together uh, a daily devotional on the next slide, and it just gives you the same verses and a, and a, and a, and a reading and a little teaching for each day, along with the names of the, wor- the week. Um, and, and I really hope, whether you use this one or not, there's lots of them out there, and I'll provide a uh, QR code for you in a minute to get that, so get your phones out. Um, it just, God has done so much for us, and this is our holy week. So I encourage us all to take time every day to celebrate and to contemplate and to celebrate again what he's done for us. Uh, the next slide, I've also got a holy week guide, and I found this on the internet. It's super cool. Um, it's got a, kind of this condensed guide to all the events in Scripture during Holy Week. So it's organized by day and event with all the Scriptures and then a map to show you where it occurred in and around Jerusalem. And then finally, slide 22, I was sharing. So there's your QR code. You can uh, go ahead and take a picture of that. Um, I will have some paper copies at the uh, Honorary McCarger Welcome Cart out front. So they are there. Um, and I, I didn't thought, think about this idea, but I was meeting with uh, a friend of mine who happens to be a gypsy firefighter, and uh, he recommended this. So thank you. Anyway, um, so let's pray. Father, thank you for this message. Thank you for this time together. May each of us, may all of us, separate and together, celebrate, contemplate, and celebrate what you've done each day this week. And may you be honored by it. May we do it as a response to what you've done for us. Not because you need it, not because we need to do it, but because we want to do it. In Jesus' name, amen.